What's up, church? Welcome to Deep Dive Live number 78. I am running behind. I am so, so sorry. I hate being late, even though I am late quite a bit. I must not hate it that much, apparently. But let's not talk about that right now. It's not about me. It's about you. So uh, today, I do want to say welcome and shalom to all you that are joining me uh, live. If you have a comment or anything, feel free to say hi in the chat. And if you're watching the re rebroadcast, feel free to say hi down in the comments down below. Today, we will be picking up in the book of Acts, chapter 5, verse 1, uh, with a very curious passage, something that Hmm. inquiring minds want to understand. Uh, but we will be working out of the New King James Version of the Bible as we have this entire series. And I will be using, as always, the blueletterbible.org web-based service. Uh, it is free, not sponsored by, but definitely appreciated by yours truly. Um, it has been my program of choice because it is one of the few that are free on a Mac. If you got a PC, you can get a bunch of free ones. But if you've got a Mac, me definitely limited options but this has been a phenomenal tool so absolutely 100% would totally uh, uh, encourage you to to use this service as much as possible and feel free to support as well uh, before we get started we will be going to the Lord in prayer uh, if at any time if you ever have a prayer request a question or a comment uh, that you don't necessarily want to leave in the chat on the live or down in a comment on a rebroadcast you can send that directly to me at TGIK questions at gmail.com and that is a for my eyes only site uh, um, email I keep calling it site I wish I had a website anyhow so before we get started uh, as is our habit we will go to the Lord in prayer and then we will jump into our study dear Heavenly Father thank you and praise you for the day you have given us thank you for the opportunity to come forward and study your word once again and Lord as I pray that you would help me guide me and direct me as we go through this uh, this confusing passage and, and help me to be able to relay uh, the meaning behind it and how it applies to us as we live our daily life. I pray that in all these things, Lord, that we come closer to you, grow stronger, walk closer to you above all other things, and to be a light in this dark and dying world. Thank you and praise you for all that you've given us, for all your blessings, because we know it's only through you that we have those things. And we ask all of this in the name of your Son, Yeshua, we pray. Amen. All right, gang, let's bounce on over here to a screen that I have not shared yet because I was running behind and I did a boo-boo. So let's fix my boo-boo. Let's get this over here right. That way you can read it a little bit better. So now this is um, Acts chapter five, verse one. Obviously, let me get a drink of coffee here real quick. This is the, uh, uh, and if you were, if you know anything about, you know, if you're raised in church at all, uh, the story of Ananias and Sapphira is a, you know, a commonly repeated story in scripture uh, but again this is first century church this is what the church looked like after the resurrection so this is the example that is laid out for us as New Testament believers uh, the book is called the Acts of the Apostles it is the history that picks up immediately after the ascension um, and uh, actually well in you know the in Acts actually literally it brings in the last part of the book of Luke and then you know streams it on in into what happened immediately thereafter so as a way which I love the way it does that is because it lets you see that this is a this is a stitched together uh, mosaic that we have and so unfortunately when we have something broken up like we have the books of the Bible you don't really see like the cohesiveness of it. So as a matter of fact, let me let me do something here real quick because I can do this very quickly in this program. So this is you see this layout here it says Acts five. You know, you have your your uh, you know chapter, the chapter and verse designation for whatever book. And then you have them conveniently separated out. They generally represent a sentence or two or a, an idea. None of that is consistent, <laughs> to be quite honest with you. It varies wildly on how they're split up, and they were done by an individual person. Uh, and the uh, the idea that was behind it was so that every week uh, he could have about the same length of message covering the scripture from Genesis to Revelation. So as they and so as he split it up, he felt like those sections were enough material for him, for him to uh, fill a sermon with. 
and so a very logical reason behind it, uh, but but not a bibli- not a, a divinely inspired reason behind it, in my humble but accurate opinion, uh, because many of the separations, many of the places where we have a new a new verse or a new chapter, it is literally in the middle of a thought. It's literally in the middle of a thought. So we it is probably better read in this format. Now this format, this is a, in a paragraph uh, format in which many, many Bibles are laid out like this. The My Daily Reader is laid out like this. Uh, and you see this still gives you the verse. You know, you still get chapter, you know, verse one. Then you see the two, three, and you still get all the annotation that you would normally have, but it's laid out in this manner. And it, it helps, it, I, th- I believe it helps us as especially Western readers uh, to view it more in line as we would with any other book that we read uh, rather than this kind of itemized list that the verse gives us. Uh, I have I'm just don't even see it. You know, I, I don't even see the chapter and verse markings. I'm just, just familiar with it. But for a person who is coming new to read the scripture for the first time, I would suggest this layout because this is going to make more sense. I mean, this is how all writing works, right? You, you, don't, you don't go to a major newspaper and it have an article and every sentence have its own line. You know, that, that's just not how we do things. So again, uh, I'm going to uh, I highly recommend uh, for readers to use this format as a way to make sure that you're reading the same scriptures with the same idea. Uh, sometimes there are scriptures that can, is this pertaining to what I just read or is this pertaining to what is coming up? And so uh, that matters, that can matter. So uh, this is not that situation, fortunately, but just as a side thought, uh, again, just trying to help, just trying to help everyone. uh, uh, How do I say this? Uh, I'm gonna give you the shortcut to studying scripture. Rather than doing it in a way that is ineffective, I wanna help you get past that two ways that are effective and reading the Bible, whatever version it is or whatever layout it is, in a manner that you are comfortable with is paramount because if you're not comfortable with it, you're not gonna read it. Now, do you want a version that tells lies? No, you don't want that, but every there, there's multiple translations out there and there are many, many very good, very solid translations that are written in ways different than what you see in the King James or the New King James Version of the Bible. Uh, again, because they understand that they're trying to, they're appealing to the market that they have. This is how people read modern English. So let's give them a Bible that's laid out in the same manner of modern English. So no idea how I got off on that one. So uh, we're in Matthew. Lord, help me. We're not in Matthew. <coughs> yeah, that was uh, 68 episodes. I, I, <coughs> excuse me. I could have did another three. Um, but you're welcome. I'm just going to say you're welcome. All right. So, uh, wow, I'm, I'm blushing over that. Yeah, it was a long, man, gosh, I, I'm like, how much can you talk about nothing? Acts 5.1, this is the story of Ananias and Sapphira. <clears throat> just to let you know, again, as a reminder, this is the book of Acts. So this is post-crucifixion. This is post-resurrection. This is post-ascension. Okay. So Yeshua has fulfilled the, what he needed to fulfill while he was here. And then the Holy Spirit comes, as we see in the second chapter. The Holy Spirit comes and, and gives power to the disciples to preach with boldness. And more things that we're going to get into as, as we go through. Again, not, not the point of today's topic. We're getting, getting caught up here. So this is after all of Jesus' work is complete. And we are now into the the ecclesia, the um, the ecclesiastical portion of our belief system. This is the modern church, the the called out ones, the uh, set aside ones, the set apart ones. Uh, that is who these. That's who Paul is talking about. Luke's talking about James, Peter. That's us. That's us. This is who we are supposed to be mimicking our church structure and our lifestyle. After is the things that we will read from here on out. No matter what your no matter what your perspective is, <laughs> you, there's, I would consider it inarguable that the Book of Acts on applies to believers in the modern day. 
if you don't agree with that, feel free to throw that down in the comments why you don't believe that, and please give supporting scriptures, because that's always what I'm going to base right and wrong on, is what thus saith the Word of God. Which, I mean, honestly, I think most people, we, 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 we want that to be what our basis for decision making is. That's what we want it to be. <laughs> Mine's not always been. So, <laughs> yours may be different, but mine's not always been on scripture as much as it's been on what was convenient for the moment for me. Wow. <clears throat> 15 minutes in, haven't even read the first passage. But a certain man, man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession. They sold a piece of land. Uh, and they kept back part of the proceeds, and his wife, also being aware of it, and they brought that certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan, why has the enemy, why has the accuser of your soul, why has he filled your heart to do what he does, which he's a liar and the father of it, he is the originator of the lie. Satan filled your heart with a lie, with filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit, to lie to the Spirit of God, and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. For yourself. While it remained, while you had it, was it not your own? After it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. So, one of the things that I want to point out here in this passage here is when Peter said, when Ananias, they sold a piece of land and they, they could have, let's say they sold it for a hundred dollars. Wait a minute. Okay. For a hundred bucks, they sold this piece of land. It was that big. It was a hundred dollars. They sold this piece of land, but they wanted to keep back 20 bucks. They could have went to the disciples and said, uh, hey, I sold a piece of land, and here's $80 of that. And laid it at the disciples' feet, and could have walked on, and this never we would have never known that it happened. But see, the, the hook is, is they wanted the people to view them as an elevated person in the community. See, because what they saw is they see in the at the end of chapter 4, they see this other individual for, who's from Cyprus. He's, he's not even from Jerusalem. He's from Cyprus. Uh, he's a Levite who sells land. He doesn't have ancestral land because he's a Levite. So any property he owned, he would have had to pay for out of his own pocket. He is selling that and bringing that in. And then I am sure that all the people would have been like, unfortunately, uh, there is that, you know, it's, a, it's, it's hard not to do that. When you see someone do a good deed, it is hard not to elevate them in some manner in your mind. And so that's what happens. So what do these people do? They decide, hey, our status is not high enough. So what we're going to do is uh, we're basically broke. And so, I mean, I'm guessing here, uh, we're in a financial cr situation ourselves, or there's a new thing that I really have my eyeball on that I want to buy. Actually, that's probably more likely the scenario. Um, with, so that I can get this thing, and then we can also look good at church. Let's make up this big tail. Now, why did his wife go along with it? Well, because she wanted to be a big deal too. Is that like surprising somehow? that, you know, a, a husband and wife team, people that are, are together, that they would have similar thought patterns or view things in a similar way. Uh, there was a lot of society then and now that views uh, uh, other people's opinions as <clears throat> currency. It has value. What you think of me matters. It doesn't, but they believe that it does. And so they were looking for this, these, some more social cred. And in looking for the social cred, they lied. And they lied when they didn't have to. That, that therein lies the, the additional problem. There was no reason for them to lie. None. They could have just brought any dollar figure and not said, or well, this is from this. Or, or could have, again, these are the proceeds from. This is what I am able or willing, <clears throat> rephrase that, this is what I'm willing 
to put into the pot. This amount. It's irrelevant what I sold property for. This is how much I'm bringing to you. And it would have been, there been again, would have never been brought up. It just would have been another person putting money into the offering. It would have been, no, no, but that's that wasn't good enough for them. And because it wasn't good enough for them, and because they craved the praise of men more than the praise of God, they lied to God. They lied to the Holy Spirit, which is God's, God's Spirit. The Holy Spirit's God's Spirit. They lied to God in front of the entire congregation. So what they're basically doing is they're walking in front of this burgeoning new religion, this first century church that's on fire, growing leaps and bounds. Everything that is going on is going to be repeated for generation after generation after generation. This is foundational blocks of the belief system. And these two nut jobs walk into the sanctuary, walk into the, the uh, Solomon's colonnade, the outer edge of the temple, outer border of the, the temple complex. They're standing in there and what do they do? They come up and they're going to tell this big fat lie and then there's people who are going to know. They're, they're, because the person who they, who they sold the property to is going to know what they paid for the property. There's going to be someone somewhere else that knows how much they paid for the property, but then they're going to be like, wait a minute, didn't you just tell the disciples that you paid this for it? The truth is going to come out. What, what we see here, in my opinion, what, you, what we see here is God showing his hand, showing his power again, as he did in Egypt. He is doing the exact same thing then here as he did in Egypt is he is showing his power. He is showing his authority and he's showing that he is the knower of the thoughts and intents of the heart, that you cannot lie to God. To lie to yourself is one thing. To lie to your friends and family is another thing. But to create, manufacture a lie, and then come before the congregation and present that to be a fact, you are in very, very, very dangerous territory. It cost these people their life. It cost them their life. Because they came up with a lie, they came up with a lie, and they stood before the congregation and pronounced this lie to be truth. And it cost them their life. I'm hoping you're pulling that together, right? Okay, let's get on to the rest of our scripture. Obvious, isn't it obvious? This is, I mean, to me, it's obvious that the, the why, why did these people die? They, they lied. They told a lie. So what? They lied. You know, lots of people lie. You know, yeah, you're not supposed to bear false witness. Yeah, we understand lying is not a good thing uh, uh, and would be considered, you know, contrary to what God's perfect will is for our life. That, that's, I'm not arguing that in any way, shape, or form. But to die for it, but to die for it, we'll see no, because it was more than just a lie. It was more than just a lie. We go back into the Old Testament and we see the man gathering six on the Sabbath. And the, the, the commandment says that if you violate the Sabbath, that you, they take you outside and stone you to death. But after, after a trial, after a trial, they took you out and they stoned you. Well, they weren't in a position to do that because they were still in the wilderness. So there's no temple. There's no none of that. Sanhedrin's not set up. There's none of that there. So what do they do? They wait for God to speak. And what does God say? Because God judged the heart, God judged his heart and says that he has to pay the price because of his heart. Because of his heart, yes, his action his action justified the punishment because of his heart. If his heart would have been in a different place, he, that could have been imputed. He could have, have paid a ransom. He could have shelled out some cash or given this, that, or the other in lieu of forsaking, giving up his life. That, that's 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 Old Testament. That's there are situations where you're a, where the the punishment is a capital punishment, but because of the situation, you are able to make some level of restitution that does not require your own blood. 
And see, so what do we have here? We fast forward into the New Testament. It's the same God. It's the same God. Here, he is showing that I am judging the thoughts and intents of the heart, just like I have from the beginning. It doesn't matter how it appears on the outside. It only matters what is on the inside. And Jesus talks about them. How is it that you are so beautiful on the outside, but the inside is full of dead man's bones, your sepulchers, your your ossuaries, your bone boxes, beautifully ornate on the outside, inside literally dead man's bones. And that is, that is what, uh, that's what Yeshua is coming against. That's what Jesus teaches against. That's what Paul is talking about. Peter, James, John, take your pick. The entirety of the New Testament is this idea that, the, the, as Jeremiah says, it is the Torah of God that is written on the tablets of our heart. It is God's instructions that are written on the tablets of our heart. And what does Ananias and Sapphira do? They allowed Satan to take that place. Just like Judas, what does it say? That Lucifer, when they, he dipped his sop in, my brother just talked about this, he dipped the sop in the cup and Lucifer entered him because he had, that's where his heart was at. His heart was no longer with, with Yeshua. His heart was no longer with the Messiah. You know, Judas did miracles. Judas did great and mighty works until, until greed filled his heart. What do we see here? Greed filling the heart. These are greed of money, greed of position, greed of recognition, whatever it is. It comes in all shapes and sizes. But because of the condition of their heart, it cost them their life. And Peter says <clears throat> um, that you kept back part of the, the land. It was all yours. You had it the whole time. You didn't lie to men, but you lied to God. And then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and expired. That breathed his last means expired. It literally, direct translations is expired. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men arose, wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. In, in Jewish culture to this day, the day that a person passes away is the day they are buried. They don't. They don't, there's no storage, even today, there's no none of that. The day you pass is the day that you go into the ground because of uh, how the Old Testament reads, and I agree with where they get that from. Uh, Acts 5 7 says, Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. So, this three hours, this is about a watch, the, the length of a time of a watch, uh, 12 hour periods overnight, 12 hour period was broken up into four watches, four three hour watches. Uh, which is when the guards would change, which is where that comes from. It's a military reference. But about three hours later, when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, and Peter answered her, excuse me, he says, uh, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. So she didn't just agree. She agreed and reiterated the amount, just so there's no confusion that there, no one was misheard. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. Uh, and the young men came in and found her dead, carrying her out, buried her by her husband, so great fear came upon all the church and all who heard these things. Two different groups, clearly. What we're looking at, and again, that I, I, I just want to point out the importance of what this is rendering out here is that, sorry for the shiner, I didn't get ambered, you know, this I, I rubbed my eye and it, and it freaking burst. Uh, and I got a sunburn out on the lake, not so anyway. But that's the point. <clears throat> it, it, one, of the, one of the lessons I think that we can take from the story of Ananias and Sapphira is the fact that uh, God does not change. And yes, yes, we are under, it is because of God's grace through Jesus' shed blood, the sacrifice that he paid, that uh, he made atonement for the transgressions that we should be paying. That I'm, I'm not, again, I base my entire ministry on, on the, that idea. Uh, uh, my, 
the, uh, how you get to heaven has never changed for me. How I live on this earth has, but how you get to heaven has never changed for me. But what you see here in this example, and again, this is post-resurrection, post-ascension, first century church, and you see people who God judges them in the manner as he judged back around Mount Sinai. Somehow that gets lost. Uh, I'm not really sure how. Uh, I think, I, I honestly, now, as I get older, I, I see now that one of the reasons why that's never really addressed um, as something that can happen is because we have spent so much time in this hyper grace movement that effectively there's almost it, it's almost like we've raised church people to believe that there's nothing that they can do that they really are going to have to suffer any penalty for. But I mean, cause and effect. Uh, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man sows, that shall he also reap. Uh, scripture does not contradict other scripture. And if you have a belief system that makes that puts if your belief system puts another scripture in contrast to what you're believing, then what you believe is wrong. You have to include all of it. All of it has to fit. You, some of it can't fit, and bits and pieces of it can't fit. And uh, these two chapters fit, but then the next two chapters contradict what I just uh, uh, you know, told you the first ones meant. Well, yeah, it's because what you said with the first chapters is wrong. Because the, the same letter has to agree with the same letter. You know, the same Bible has to agree with the same Bible. The, the, you have to use Scripture to define Scripture, and you have to understand these ideas that happen, that transpire. They're not allegoric representation. These are real events. Those are real people. They really happen, and they really put those people in the ground because of a condition in their heart, and they chose to bring that before the congregation and represent this lie as being true, and it cost them their life. So I would, I would highly recommend for my uh, New Testament believers um, that we take, we put more weight, more thought, consideration into the words we use and the things we say and the things we affirm and the things we overlook because there are still consequences to what we're doing. You know, the, the Bible talks about works and reward and uh, crowns and gems do you think those maybe have some kind of barometer to gauge how much a person has or doesn't have? Wouldn't that make sense? What do you think that might be based on? Maybe the faith without works is dead. Maybe that. Maybe what we do <clears throat> does matter. This is a very negative side of it, but it matters. The other side would be true as well. So just something to think about. All right, guys. Uh, if you ever have any comments, questions, anything like that, let me double check. All right. If you have any comments, if you're watching live, please throw that up in the chat. And on the rebroadcast, put those down below in the comments. I do greatly appreciate it. love reading them and interacting. If you guys, uh, if this is content that you enjoy and you feel I have earned it, please like, share, and subscribe. I would appreciate it. Uh, and if I have not, please let me know how I can correct that because that would be cool. I would love to be like, you know, correct. <laughs> and it's, I'm not even sure <clears throat> that's that's possible at this point in my life. Why start now? Right, right. Why start now? All right. I'm just playing. I'm totally playing. I'm right all the time. <clears throat> anyway, so I'm going to have to go repent for that. Uh, but this ties into that. So uh, and I say this all the time. Uh, if you if you never remember anything that I ever say, remember this. Read and pray every day. It will absolutely change your life. It'll change who you are. It'll change your picture of who he is. It will give you a walk that I promise you, I promise you, it will give you a walk with the creator of the universe that you didn't think was really true. It's not a fairy tale. He is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Let's read and pray every day. It's all about relationship, right? All about relationship. All right. Love you guys very much. Uh, I will see you uh, tomorrow night at 6. Yeah, 7. I changed time zones, I guess. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. All right, guys. I uh, love you guys very much, and I will see you tomorrow night at 6. Bye.